In my opinion, branding is one of the most overused and overhyped ideas in the modern business world. Is branding overhyped? That's what we're going to talk about today. Let's go. Hello friends, welcome back to Flux where we talk design, business, everything in between. My name is Matt Brunton and today we're asking, has branding been overhyped? Some people really gravitate to the things that are easier to measure. They feel more tangible. How is our website converting? What about our advertising? How many click-throughs are we getting? What are, what's the data? Or perhaps things like quality control, if, if we just have a good product. So how many years does it take for the product to break? How many returns do we get out of a batch of 1,000? And, and grabbing onto those numbers. And if we can optimize those things, So the product breaks less frequently, more people visit the website, it converts better, then hey, they're the things that really matter. And branding, branding's kind of this flowery thing that's done around the edges and it's it's not really important for most businesses. Is that true? Well, I wonder about a brand like Teenage Engineering. You see here on their website, they've got wireless audio, synthesizers. Look at this computer case, this orange thing. What a thing of beauty that is. It's almost making me want to move from Mac to PC. Or this uh, radio, this it's basically a Bluetooth speaker. It's 649 pounds, so the best part of 1,000 US dollars. But the whole way this is presented with this uh, photography, but it's all built all the way through. Universe typeface is consistent with their whole modernist aesthetic but it's not just an aesthetic it's a it's a whole attitude it's an aesthetic when it comes to uh, the product design and the user interface of the products and that bakes it all the way through into uh, their photography and the graphic design that comes through on the end it's a consistency of brand things like their uh, synthesizers So most synthesizers kind of look like, um, you know, an electronic keyboard, if you're not familiar with this sort of world. But look what these look like. This is the OPZ with this green, blue, yellow, red uh, wheels along the top. Or the famous OP1 that's uh, won kind of all kinds of design awards. But it's presented as uh, sculptural, as architectural. And that presentation is on the end of a consistent brand journey all the way through, through all the elements of design. It's a design-led brand. And this is a whole strategy behind what they're doing. But when you talk to people who are skeptical, I don't recommend arguing with them, even (laughs) giving them examples like this, because I think the important thing is not to argue in general, let's be, (laughs) let's try and avoid conflict if we can, but let's find common ground with people. That's the way to win people over. And if they don't want to talk about branding, talk about reputation. Glastonbury Festival sells out every year before they reveal the lineup. Every other music festival has to book the best acts possible to try and sell tickets. And it's all about who's going to be playing. Glastonbury, I think last time it sold out in like 30 minutes, like 100, 200,000 tickets, whatever it is. And it goes on its reputation alone. A brand is a promise. If we go to a local restaurant anywhere in the world and order a chicken sandwich, what we get is going to be something different every time. It might have salad with it, it might have different types of bread, the chicken cooked in different ways. You're not quite sure what they're gonna bring out. But if you go to KFC and order a Zinger burger, your expectation is that it's gonna be the same every single time. That's their brand's promise and it's their reputation. It's what you expect beforehand. And it's funny because in this book that I, I read from in the pre-roll, it's the, the Personal MBA by Josh Kaufman. And it's actually a really good book. I recommend uh, you checking this out. It's kind of got like a, a glossary of a lot of business uh, terms and it's a really helpful uh, overview. But he actually, this quote about branding was in this Uh, section called reputation. He goes on and says, there's nothing magical or complex about building a brand. When business professionals say they want to enhance their brand or build brand equity, they almost always mean improve their reputation. 
end quote. So in a way, uh, Kaufman here is actually rebranding branding. He wants to talk about the idea of a brand, but he just wants to call it reputation. In fact, he says at the end of this chapter, building your reputation takes time and effort, but it's the most effective kind of marketing there is. I mean, I'd call that building a brand. <laughs> it's that long-term effectiveness of marketing because you have such a great reputation. But there's more to it than that or more nuance. If they don't want to talk about branding, talk about positioning. Find that place in the market. I want to show you a couple of print, magazine, brochure, catalogue, type documents that you'll find in two supermarkets in the UK. This one is from Aldi, which is a discount supermarket, which I know is also in the US and in Germany and across Europe. And this is all about offers, buys. We can see here we've got the different brand colors going on. There's blue and orange and red and yellow. And we've got box outs with these drop shadows, all these different offers, we've got prices on the cover uh, with red uh, bars behind them and kind of lots of things to look at. And as we go through this document, we see there's offers on every single page. That's what it's for. And, and this is presented on their website. That This is the thing that they, they want to share. And it's the thing you can find in print in the stores. And all the way through, it's offers, it's box outs, it's highlights, it's grabbing your attention and it's totally product focused. If we go to another supermarket called Waitrose, which is uh, a much more upmarket supermarket in the UK, you can see here they've got Royal Standards appearing on their cover. We see here something that's more editorial. It looks like a, a magazine that you might buy. It's got many more pages in it. We have uh, use of white space here, the editorial style, one full bleed image, that's it. And as we move through, we have a welcome from the editor. We have this uh, magazine style list of contributors and a table of contents. So this is what they're choosing to produce. I think Aldi may do other publications too, but these are what they're sharing on the website and it is what you'll find in the store. And it's interesting the choice that they make. Look, they're given a whole page here to a strawberry dipped in chocolate. That's very indulgent, not just food wise, but um, in their choice of layout. Uh, the type of products that they include and the way the photography is presented. Look, we've got kale here shot in a very editorial style. And these differences help us realize you may have not be familiar with these supermarkets. You might not be from the UK. And you've never heard of Waitrose. But just by looking at these brochures, it's very clear that one is for a discounter and one is for a more high end offer. And that's quite obvious. Now, people may say that's not just branding. There's a clear difference here in the products. But what about when there isn't? Think about a brand like Colourful Standard. You may not be familiar with them, but what they do is simple basics in solid colours with no uh, visible logos on the products, on the outside of the product. You can just see this label inside. And they don't, they don't have stores everywhere. They have this flagship store in London. And the way everything is presented is minimalist. No external logos, nothing brash. It's very ordered. It's very calming. And they just present these basics. But these products are actually made in a factory in Portugal. And they're very good quality. They're very high quality. They're not like the basics you would get from a discounter or from a supermarket. Uh, they're much better quality manufacturing and also the materials. Check out this guy. He looks like a friendly bloke. <laughs> so you know who's making it. So uh, ethics and sustainability and the environment and uh, less consumption are at the heart of their branding. So they have a message. They have a story that they're telling. The product themselves is actually the same as a lot of designer labels who uh, manufacture their products in Portugal. Portugal is well known for its shoes and its clothing manufacturer being somewhere that produces high quality goods. So products might come out of this very same factory that have gaudy fashion brand labels emblazoned all over them. And it's the exact same factory with the exact same materials, but with colorful standard, it's their story 
that is differentiating them from a brand that perhaps charges twice as much, even though the, these products are not the cheapest, because they have a large logo emblazoned on it. And that's the difference that branding can make. And these people are choosing to position themselves in different way, even with what's effectively the same product. I wonder what somebody like Josh Kaufman, who wrote this, uh, this book we quoted from at the beginning, would make of a brand like Supreme. I mean, all they have really is their brand, their story. I mean, bizarre the things that, that they've sold and, and, and done. But if, if we look at their website, which you have to zoom in quite a lot here to read this, but they talk about the fact that their brand is their key element. It's all about their culture. Um, culture, culture is repeated. It's a brand known for quality, style and authenticity. And I think this is the key sentence at the end a unique identity and attitude. That's what characteristic uh, characterizes Supreme, even though it might just be a white t-shirt or a white mug or some of the bizarre merch that they've sold over the years, but people pay a premium. In fact, people line up to buy this stuff because there's something about Supreme's attitude. They have their own identity. So with positioning, it's that intelligence to compete where you can win. And that just makes sense. You've got to use your relative strength against uh, your opponent's relative weakness, or you've got to move into an area of opportunity. And that's what positioning does. And brand strategy is often about finding that position in the market where you can compete and you can win. And finally, if people don't want to talk about branding, then talk to them about personality. A brand like Innocent Smoothies, and these were bought by Coca-Cola for some huge amount of, uh, a few years ago, a real startup success story, but they don't just sell fruit smoothies. They have their own style, their own take, their own personality, and they're very wacky. They're a little bit offbeat, and this is part of uh, who they are as a brand. Even on this page, which... You can find about information about their products, like the ingredients and things that go in it, things that you find on any food manufacturer's website. But look, they have this bit, check out the back of the pack, even the way it's written in this sort of handwritten style. And they've got these weird little uh, copy on the back, diving headfirst into a plunge pool, getting your head around a cryptic crossword, watching Pavarotti perform Ness and Dorma. There are loads of ways to energize yourself, but not all of them are quite as tasty as this super smoothie. So it's just random and it brings across a feel. It brings across a vibe. And this is where, again, some people might start getting a little bit twitchy in business, saying branding's all about hype, but vibe, what you're talking about? Is this where branding just becomes BS? But personality is characteristics, it's quality. Just be because something's more difficult to quantify on a balance sheet doesn't make it any less real. Your friends, people you know, each of them has their own personality, their own vibe. Maybe that's why you're friends with them. And it, and it means something and you feel something. And humans are behind brands. It's humans that write this copy. And, and we can relate to things and we can feel things through aesthetics, through copy, through our experience, through the story uh, that we can buy into. People often forget when they're trying to be a bit, a bit hard-nosed about these things, that there are different levels of brand loyalty and they think it's all about utility. But utility is only the first level. Utility means I use this because it, it works for me. That shop is close to my house. That garage is on the way home. This is in my community. Or it's, uh, they offer next day delivery or uh, the product uh, works. It's, it's functional. That's utility. But that's the first level of brand loyalty. People also use things because of community. I do this because my friends do it also or because of uh, what my peers uh, think of me. Like you might uh, join a local sports club because it's the nearest one to your home. But then you make friends there. And even if you move house, you might continue your membership there because now you're part of a team. You're part of a community. But the next level of brand loyalty, the highest level is identity, where it's not just because the thing works or because you're part of something, but because it becomes part of who you are. Even 
something like a nation, which really is a brand. I mean, countries don't exist in nature. These are human constructs that have emerged throughout history. Now, you might move to a nation because of utility. Perhaps you're persecuted or perhaps you've just been offered a job in another country or perhaps you like the lifestyle somewhere else or it's better weather. So you move because of utility, but then you make friends or you build a network. That's community. So you're there for that reason. But for a lot of people, their nation is part of their identity, who they are. They say, I am British. I am Kenyan. I am Japanese. I am Australian. I am Brazilian. And that becomes part of who they are and the story that they tell themselves and they tell others about themselves. And all this psychology is part of the way that pe people make decisions, even about things like the car that they buy. And it's not all about utility and it's naive to forget that. Branding is overhyped if we create a narrow definition of what branding is and then pit that against all of the business functions. But that's a straw man argument. And it just results from insecurity. People want to say the thing that they do is the most important or it's just clickbait. And they want to criticize branding so they can get you in to talk about the thing that they're interested in. But to me, it's good sense as well as good business to think about how do you want to be perceived and why are you in business in the first place, more fundamentally, and then position yourself where you can win and ensure that everything that you do from aesthetics to customer service is consistent with that position. That's building a brand. That's a brand platform from which you can communicate your value. You can tell your story. And you can adjust non-fundamental elements as you go. And I think that's right. And the data is important. But you need a direction. You need a reason for existing. And you need a meaningful difference to be able to share with your customers. If you have something thoughtful to contribute, then keep this conversation going down in the comments. And if you're here at the end of this video, then you're definitely interested enough to subscribe to Flux because we have more branding content coming very soon. <laughs>